All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's Pastor Mike Dixon at Winterville Baptist Church. This is Wednesday, January the 20th, 2021. I hope that you're doing well and you're being blessed. And I hope in these unstable times that you're stable and you've got peace and assurance and you know God's going to see us through. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in by way of live stream. I want to ask you to do something for me if you would. If you'd find that little tab that says like, if you'd click that like button and also go over and click the share button. It's important that you click the share button because that will share this Bible study on your Facebook page. And that way we'll be able to reach not just folks that we've got on our Facebook page, but folks that are on your Facebook page. So that will broaden our audience, our outreach, as far as touching more hearts with the gospel. Folks need to know what this last book in the Bible is all about in these last days in which we live. Now, I want to just make sure you know about this. If you live in Pitt County, it's time for you to call this telephone number and schedule a time that you can come by and get your COVID-19 vaccine. This is the number that you call right now. It's 65 years of age and older. So if you're 65 or older and you live in Pitt County, now is the time for you to dial this number and set up an appointment, a time that you can come by and get that vaccine. Let's continue to pray for one another. As most of you know, Winterville Baptist Church is not having any in-person gatherings through the month of January. Hopefully, once we get into February, we're still watching the numbers. We're praying about it. want to walk in wisdom. But hopefully, in just a few weeks, we're going to be able to come back in together, back into the building like we were just prior to Christmas when we were coming in the fellowship hall as well as the sanctuary. And we'll revert back to that plan hopefully soon. So be in prayer about that. We'll let you know within the next couple of weeks, at least before the month of January is completely over, what our plan is as we enter into the month of February. But pray for us as we make those decisions. We're in the book of the Revelation on Wednesdays. We're going through this book verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And today we pick up where we left off. That's in Revelation chapter 12. Now, don't try to adjust your screen. I know it looks a lot differently than what it usually does. I've had one or two people tell me in the last couple of weeks they've missed my PowerPoint on the Bible study. So I'm trying to incorporate that into this week's Bible study. Sometimes technology can be a challenge, and this has already been a challenge for me. But I hope this works smoothly, and I hope that it gives you more information. You can take notes as I put these slides up. Uh, you'll have the points that I'm going to be speaking of in Revelation chapter 12, and you can jot those down and take those notes as we grow together and as we learn together. The title of the series through this last book in the Bible is simply Revelation Revealed. We see our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, revealed in the last book in the Bible, unlike any other book in Scripture. Again, today we're in Revelation chapter 12. This is where we left off last week. We looked at Revelation chapter 11. We're covering about a chapter every week. And by the way, if you miss a Bible study, don't fret. You can go to this Facebook and you can scroll down and you should be able to find the previous study. We're also trying to post these on the church's website by way of audio. So if you can't find it here on Facebook, go to Winterville Baptist, Winterville Baptist I got to check and make sure I'm telling you that right as far as the um, website is concerned. Yeah, WinnerbilleBaptist.org, and you'll see a tab up at the top that says Sermons, and it'll drop down, and you can search for the messages there, the Bible studies, as well as the Sunday morning sermons. Sunday mornings right now, I'm preaching through the book of Jonah, and we're having a great time in that, so you might want to check out those messages as well. Know your enemy. I want to teach this chapter in a very practical way, and I believe it's very timely as far as where we are um, as a nation and as a people and as Christians in these last days in which we're living. We need to know our enemy. Your enemy is not your husband. It's not your spouse. Your enemy is not the government of the United States. Your enemy is not some foreign government. Your enemy is not your boss. Your enemy is not uh, that guy you can't get along with in your neighborhood. Your enemy is of a spiritual nature. And I believe sometimes we need to be reminded of that, and especially in times of chaos and unrest like we're living in right now. It's real easy to get off track and to lose your focus as far as what you're supposed to be doing as far as what God says in his word. You know, when it comes to our enemies, our Lord said this in Luke 6, verse 27. He says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. That's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it, my friends? 
Sometimes I read a passage of scripture talking about God's grace or mercy or the fact that he'll never lead me. He's never going to forsake me. Or when I study uh, the biblical truth about heaven, that excites me. You know, I, I get in there and I say, oh, wow. Yeah, give me more of that. Give me more grace. Give me more mercy. Give me more heaven. I want to think about that. I want to teach about that. I want to preach about that. I want to sing about that. But then I get to a passage like Luke 6, 27, where Jesus said, I'm supposed to love my enemies. I'm supposed to do good to those that hate me. That's not easy to do, is it? I mean, let's be honest. That's not easy to do. That's a God goal there, isn't it? I mean, we're never going to be able to reach this standard in the flesh in our own power. We've got to look to God and ask God to help us to do just that. And so I know the enemy, our real enemy of a spiritual nature, uses people oftentimes around us to try to get to us and to tear us down. How should we treat those people? Well, again, Jesus said you need to love them and you need to do good to those that hate you. So let's reach out to those people that are rubbing us wrong. Instead of uh, being like a mirror and just holding up a mirror and reflecting their attitude. And so when they're mean to you, you're going to be mean to them. They cuss at you, you're going to cuss at them. They do something bad to you, you're going to do something bad to them. Instead of retaliating, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to love those folks. And we're supposed to try to do good towards those people. Now, even though that's not easy, we can do it. And again, I know the enemy many times, our real enemy, he uses people around us to get to us. But people are not our real enemy. People are not really our enemy that we need to be focused on as far as overcoming and as far as defeating. Ephesians 6 verse 12 reminds us, uh, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so this spiritual battle is real. The enemy is real. And we need to be on guard against the enemy. We need to make sure that uh, we're properly equipped to fight the enemy so we can overcome the enemy. Now, when we get to Revelation chapter 12, I just want to remind you as far as the context is concerned, we're about halfway through the seven-year tribulation period. Now, again, I believe... The church is raptured out of this world, and you've got that recorded in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, where John on the Isle of Patmos looks up and he sees a door open in heaven, and he hears a voice saying, come up here. I believe that's the rapture of the church, and the rapture of the church is when Jesus Christ comes in the sky, and he catches away his bride. The real church, the true church, those that belong to the Lord, those that are really saved, are going to be called up to be with the Lord. We're going to be raptured away. And as the Lord catches us up to meet him in the clouds, we're going to heaven at that point in time. Now, the history of the world is not over yet. Even though the earth has been removed, what's going to immediately follow on planet earth is the seven-year tribulation period. Seven years in duration. This is the same period of time that Daniel in the Old Testament talked about and referred to as Daniel's 70th year. This is when the Antichrist is going to rise to power. The church is out of the way. And so uh, the restraining force that's in the world now, as far as born again, spirit filled believers is going to be removed. And so with that restraining force removed from a wicked world, evil is just going to run rapid. We think it's bad now, but how much more this evil is going to be multiplied once the church is removed. And so the church is raptured away. We're snatched out of the world. That's what the word rapture means. We're called up to be with the Lord. Evil is going to run rapid on this earth for seven years in the seven-year tribulation period. We've already seen the series of the seal judgments during the tribulation period. God's dealing with the wicked world. Uh, most importantly, God's dealing with his chosen people, the Hebrews, the Jewish people during the seven-year tribulation period. And as bad as the seven-year tribulation period is when it begins... It gets very rapidly worse. It goes from bad to worse very quickly in this seven-year period. And so right now in Revelation chapter 12, as far as the timeline of things, uh, we believe that we're about halfway into the seven-year tribulation period. So three and a half years into the seven-year tribulation period. There's already been war. There's already been famine. One-third of all the trees and the grass has been destroyed. One-third of the fresh drinking water has been polluted. Uh, much of the salt water bodies on the earth have also been polluted. Um, uh, there's been a lot of bloodshed, a lot of war going on. By the time you get 
to what's happening in Revelation chapter 12. Now, let's call our attention to the word as we look here in Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. And I'm going to read this text. You follow along in your copy of the word. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1, And a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems, or those are crowns. Verse 4, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Verse 5, she gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now, if you take that 1,260 days, you multiply that by 30, 30 30-day months. And that's how the ancient world actually um, viewed their calendars, 30-day months. You'll come up with three and a half. This is three and a half years, three and a half years, three and a half years of 30-day months, 1,260 days, the last half of the tribulation period, the last three and a half years. Verse 7, now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. And the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Now, that's referring to three and a half years again. Now, look at verse 15. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God. And hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. Wow. Don't be discouraged when you read that chapter and think there's no way I'm going to understand this. I want you to hang in there with me for the next few moments. But right now, let's bow our heads together in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessed word. And Lord, we confess We're never going to be able to understand what we just read apart from your Holy Spirit. So we pray that you would bless the reading of your word. I ask that you'd open our hearts up to you as you speak to us. And I pray you'd help us to take it, receive it, accept it, and apply it to our lives. That it would make a difference in the way that we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Know your enemy. Now I'm going to get to Genesis 37 in just a moment. But know your enemy. Who is your enemy? You know, there's a lot of people on the earth today, even in so many churches today, who really don't believe in a literal devil. A lot of people, I'm afraid, on this earth don't want to think that there's really a devil and there's really demons. Well, I'm here to tell you they're real. And I don't know how people like that can have that kind of attitude towards evil, because when I read the news and I cut on the television and I... uh, 
check into my news apps on my phone and I read about current events and things that are happening around me, it's evident to me that there's a battle going on. And it's a battle that maybe we can't literally see with our eyes. We can see the effects of the battle with our eyes, but there's a spiritual battle raging. There's a battle between good and evil. There's a battle between God and the devil and the demons, which are fallen angels, and it's going on all around us, and we see evidence of that in our world. In fact, in Ephesians 6, verse 12, again, it says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We can't see the real enemy. The real enemy is of a spiritual nature. Now, when I think about demons and I think about the devil, I think about demonology, that's the study of demonic forces around us. You know, there's really two extremes, and a lot of people go with one of these two extremes. You can take the extreme that I just mentioned and you can go through life and you can just, uh, you know, deny that there is a real devil, deny that there are demons around us, deny and live your life paying no attention to the spiritual battle that's going on around us. You can go that extreme or you can go the other extreme and that's you become obsessed with demonology. And so you're looking for demons behind every rock. You're seeing demons behind every struggle, every problem that you have in life. And you actually become more focused on demons than you are our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what God's called us to do. Now, I believe there's a biblical balance in between those two extremes. I believe that the place that we need to settle as far as our belief and the way that we're living our lives and the way that we're thinking is in the middle of those two extremes somewhere, and that's on biblical truth on what God says in his word. You know, when I think about the extreme of looking for a demon behind every rock and every problem that you have, I think about when I was growing up as a teenager and how we used to take vinyl records, we would take albums of like the Beatles and we'd play them backwards. We'd cut the phonograph on and we'd take our finger and we would rotate the record backwards and we'd listen for satanic messages. Some of you right there with me, you remember those days as well. And so that's what I'm talking about. Going to that extreme where you're just looking for a demon uh, behind every rock and in every problem that you face. Well, let's get on some biblical ground. That's what I want to do in this study today in Revelation chapter 12. Let's understand our enemy and know our enemy biblically. Let's not be obsessed with him. Let's not deny that he exists. But at the same time as born again Christians, we don't need to be afraid of him. Because the Bible says, if you're saved, greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. And that's talking about our enemy. That's talking about the devil and the demons. The Holy Spirit of God that lives in us as believers is so much greater, so much more powerful than the demons and the devil. And so we don't have to be afraid. So let's get on biblical ground today as we talk about this subject of knowing our enemy. Now, in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 12, we've got a woman mentioned. Now, the Roman Catholic Church and a few others um, believe that this woman is the Virgin Mary. Now, I don't believe that's true. I don't believe this woman is the Virgin Mary, number one, because the Bible says that the woman flees into the wilderness. And so that really doesn't fit uh, with the biblical account of the Virgin Mary. I believe the best way to understand Scripture is to take Scripture and interpret Scripture with Scripture. And so I believe that's the first place that we need to go in trying to understand what some certain Bible passage is talking about. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, I believe the woman here represents Israel, God's chosen people. And I go to Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 and 10 uh, that you've got on your screen uh, right now in uh, Genesis chapter 37. Let me just read that first verse, verse 9. This is the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors. Remember that? How he was a dreamer. And how he had these dreams. Well, Genesis 37 verse 9 says, Then he dreamed another dream. Joseph dreamed another dream. He told it to his brothers and he said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars were bowing down before me. Now, let me pause right here and say, In Genesis 37 verse 9, we've got a reference to the sun and the moon. That is the father and the mother of of Joseph, the one who's had this dream. He's had this dream, and this is a picture of his mother and his father 
the sun and the moon. The 11 stars are the 11 brothers of Joseph. So if you add Joseph to the stars, there's 12 stars. You've got that as a reference here in Revelation chapter 12. And so I believe as we look in Genesis 37 and we look at Revelation chapter 12, we've got the identification of the woman. The woman actually is the Hebrew people. It's the Jewish people. It's the people of Israel. That's the woman referred to in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1. Now, uh, Genesis 37 verse 10, the second verse, uh, what was the response of Joseph's father, Jacob? He said to his son, after his son shared this dream, he said, what is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to you and bow down on the ground before you? Do you think that we're going to worship you? So the woman in Revelation chapter 12 verse 1 is Israel, the nation of Israel. That's who the woman is. You know, the church in the Bible is often called the bride of Christ. We're his bride. And more than once, Israel is pictured in the Bible and referred to as a woman. So going back to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 1, we've got the woman, we've got Israel, the Jewish people represented here. And then we've got a child mentioned in verse 2. This woman gives birth to a child. Now again, the woman is Israel. Israel, out of Israel would come the Messiah. Jesus would be born through the Hebrew people. He would come just like the prophets in the Old Testament foretold. He would come through the Hebrews. God would bless all the world. That was the promise God made to Abraham. That was one of the promises. All the people of the world are going to be blessed by you because from Abraham would come Israel. From Israel would come this child Jesus. So the woman here represents the child that we've got uh, represents Jesus. Now, you know, one of the great evidences of the fact that God exists and that Israel is God's chosen people God's chosen nation, the Hebrews, is the fact that Israel still exists today. I mean, just look at this map right here. You've got that little red area right in the middle of this map that I've got on your screen. That's Israel. Israel's just a tiny little nation, just a spot on the map. 150 miles from the furthest northern border of Israel to the furthest southern border of Israel, just 150 miles from north to south. A small nation stuck right in the middle right here and all around in this dark green, all around this tiny little nation of Israel is Israel's enemies. Yet Israel still exists. All these enemies around Israel would love nothing better than just annihilate, get rid of Israel, blow Israel off the map. And down throughout the history of the Hebrew people, indeed the world has tried to do that over and over and over again. But behind the efforts of a demonic world are demons. See, that's the real enemy. The devil has always been after God's chosen people. The devil has always been after the Messiah. The devil has always been after God's plan. And if he could, he would be victorious and wiping out not just Israel, but wiping out the church. But guess what? He can't do it. No matter how hard he tries, he can't do it. Because again, greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. God's power far exceeds and excels the power of our enemy. You know, as we look at this, we think about this, I think about something that Jesus said. It's recorded in Luke 21, verse 20. Jesus said this. He said, but when you see it, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Now, that desolation is the same uh, desolation that Daniel talked about in Daniel uh, chapter 9 and the desolation, the abomination of desola des desolation actually refers to the last three and a half years of the tribulation period and that's what we're looking at in the timeline as we get to Revelation chapter 12 right here in our study and Jesus said again recorded in Luke 21 20 when you see Jerusalem surrounded by its enemies, surrounded by armies, know that the last half of the tribulation period is near. Now, we already see this today as far as the armies surrounding Israel. That's already in place. That's already happening. And if not, by the grace and the power of God, Israel would be wiped out, but nobody's going to be able to wipe Israel out. Israel is God's chosen people. God's still got a plan for Israel. 
But if we already see this happening today, and Jesus said when you see it happening, the second half of the seven-year tribulation period is near. If that's true, how much closer the first three and a half years of the tribulation period must be? And if that is true, which it is, how much closer the rapture of the church must be since the rapture of the church is going to happen before the seven-year tribulation period ever begins? And so we've got to be... We've, we've got to be in the know as far as God's people and knowing the signs of the times and what's happening. And so this abomination of desolation, this worst part of the tribulation period, what's referred to as the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation period, that's going to be when the Antichrist is going to go into the temple of God. That's going to be rebuilt on the temple mount in Jerusalem where God's people are going to be allowed to come back in and worship and offer sacrifices to God. And the last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to go into the holy temple of God. He's going to desecrate it. That's the desolation. That's the abomination of desolation that's happening. That's referred to in the book of Daniel and in the book of the Revelation and in other places of scripture. The worst time the world has ever seen. How much closer that is today than it's ever been before. So the woman here represents the woman represents Israel. The child in Revelation 12 verse 2 represents Jesus. Now, make sure you jot that down because you got to get that clear if you're going to understand the rest of this 12th chapter. Now, the first point, I want to say three things about this text. Number one, let me say something about the devil's description. Because the devil's described to, the, to us, the uh, adversary of God's people, the adversary of Israel is how that applies right here in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, verse 3 says, there appeared in heaven a great red fiery dragon. That's the devil himself. Red is a picture of bloodshed. He's a bloodthirsty, demonic, powerful force in the world today. Our enemy is real. Demons are real. Demons are fallen spirits, fallen angels. And they're in this world uh, to go after mankind with vengeance, bloodshed, a, a great red fiery dragon, the devil himself. Now the Bible says he's got seven heads. What does that mean? Well, seven in the Bible is the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. As we look at the description of our enemy, the devil himself, this great red dragon, we notice he's got seven heads. That represents the fact that he's got great intelligence. He's got great wisdom. He's got great intellect. The devil is not stupid. And if you think that you're going to face the devil in the flesh and your power, you are mistaken, my friend. You don't have the power to overcome him. You got to make sure that you're born again, you're spirit filled when you fight the battle against spiritual forces of a demonic nature. You've got to make sure you've got the power of God in you. So seven heads, this is talking about great intelligence. Uh, that's that number seven. Uh, the devil is not some guy running around in red leotards with horns on his head and a pitchfork and a long tail. That's not the devil. The devil here, we see him for who he really is. This red dragon and seven heads of great intelligence. The Bible says he's got, uh, he's got horns on his head. And that's talking about the nations that are under his dominion, under his reign. Now, I just want to remind you where the devil came from, where Satan originated. He actually was created as an angel in heaven. His name as an angel was Lucifer, bright and morning star. Originally, the devil was up in heaven. He was an angel created by God in the presence of God in heaven, created there to do God's bidding to do whatever God would have him to do, and yet his heart began to fill up with pride. Remember the devil, Lucifer, uh, if you would, wanted to be God. In fact, jot this text down. It's in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 14. The Bible referring to Lucifer, the angel, before he became Satan, says this in Ezekiel 28, 14. Thou art the anointed cherub, or you are the anointed angel. Verse 15 of Ezekiel 28 says, You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. And so I'm just reminding you where the devil came from originally. He was Lucifer in heaven. 
Uh, he was created by God. He was good. He was an angel until he began to want to be God, and then he was cast down out of heaven. And so the devil's not stupid. Seven heads, great intelligence. Um, he's red. He's going after blood. He's a man of war, a spirit of war, a person of war, of bloodshed against God's chosen people, Israel, against God's uh, anointed bride, the church. If you're a born-again believer, he'll come after you, and you've got to make sure that you're ready to fight that battle, not in your power, but in the power of God. Now, He's the one who violently opposes Israel. Now, halfway through the tribulation period, we've got the Antichrist. He's coming to power. You've got ten horns mentioned here on this red dragon. Those ten horns are ten kingdoms, ten nations of the world. They line up under the Antichrist who's empowered by the devil himself. See, during the tribulation period, the real enemy is not the Antichrist. The real enemy is the one who's going to empower the Antichrist. And that's going to be the devil himself. And ten kingdoms, ten of the world's kingdoms are going to line up under the authority of the Antichrist, this one world leader, uh, during the seven-year tribulation period. <clears throat> Many commentators and scholars believe that these ten nations are the, they represent the revived Roman Empire. But they're going to just, these rulers of these nations are, are going to freely just give over their kingdoms to the Antichrist. And uh, there's not going to be battles that are going to have to be fight. They're just going to hand over their kingdom to this one world leader. The Bible says that the dragon has seven diadems or crowns upon his head. And, of course, that's talking about this coalition of ten nations that are under, under him. And uh, the devil through the Antichrist is going to reign over them. Now, notice her child. The devil especially hates this woman's child, which we've already identified <clears throat> as Jesus. The Bible says in verse 4, His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. You know, in Satan's original rebellion in heaven when he was known as Lucifer, um, up in heaven, an angelic being that God created and he was cast down out of heaven. One third of all the angels of heaven also were cast down with him. And they are, they're uh, demons, they're fallen angels. That was a third of the angels in heaven because a third of all the angels lined up under Lucifer's uh, plan and plot to take over the godship of God Almighty. As foolish as that sounds, he thought he could do it and he convinced a third of the angels that lined up under his authority in heaven as Lucifer. And so when Lucifer was cast down out of heaven as a fallen angel, one third of all the angels in heaven also were cast down, and we know them as demons today. Now, I don't know how many angels there are, but we ought to find assurance here in knowing that our demons are outnumbered two to one because it was a third of the angels that were cast out of heaven who followed Lucifer and their demons today, just a third. So we've got him outnumbered two to one uh, right from the get-go. The Bible says that Satan's tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to earth. Now notice this. The dragon stood before the woman that represents Israel. The dragon stood before Israel who was about to give birth. Now this is a reference. This, is a, this goes back to Genesis 3.15, the proto-evangelism passage where we've got the first reference of the gospel in Genesis 3.15 talking about the seed of the woman. And that's the same seed here, the seed that's going to come through Israel. And that's the Messiah. That's Jesus Christ. Remember how when Mary was pregnant and she was about to give birth uh, to the Messiah, how a decree was issued. And everybody had to go back to their hometown it's not by accident or chance that that happened when Mary was about to give birth to her child. And they had to load up the donkeys and Joseph had to take his wife that's about to give birth on a very difficult journey. <clears throat> and again, she's nine months pregnant. She's about to give birth. And they finally get to their destination and they uh, register and they try to get somewhere to stay and they can't stay anywhere and they end up in a stable with the animals and that's where the Christ child is born. I believe from the very beginning, the devil's been after Jesus. There was an order that was issued, remember, that all the male children be destroyed. 
Um, Herod was trying to get to the Christ child. He didn't know where the Christ child was. Remember, he was trying to get the wise men to tell him. And finally, he just issued this law that uh, any of the male children that were just born were to be killed. The devil, see, it wasn't that Herod is the real enemy. It's the devil and the demons that's the real enemy. And uh, the dragon has been after this child from the very beginning, even before he was ever born. Verse 5 says, she gave birth to a male child. And uh, that's God in human flesh. One who is to rule all the nations. Now, that's a reference to what I believe is going to be the millennial reign of Christ at the end of the tribulation period when Jesus comes back to planet Earth and he sets up his 1,000-year reign on planet Earth. I believe that's a reference to that. He's going to rule all the nations of the world with a rod of iron. With a rod of iron. Her child. Uh, but her child was caught up to God. And that's talking about the ascension. So it's all pointing, this part is pointing to something that's already happened. Jesus has already come. He's already died on the cross, already rose again, already appeared so many times in a period of 40 days before he ascended back to the Father in heaven. That's already taken place. And so that's speaking of the ascension of Christ. The child is called up to God. But then the Bible goes on, and the Bible now is talking about something that's not happened yet, but it's going to happen. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God. That's talking about the Jewish remnant during the tribulation period that God is protecting. God has given safe, safe haven to in the wilderness somewhere, in that place prepared by God, and God is protecting that remnant of the Jewish people. Now, uh, God's always going to have a remnant. You know, the devil's not going to be able to wipe out the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, Israel. The devil's not going to be able to wipe out the church. Uh, there's always going to be a remnant of God's people upon, upon planet Earth here. So we've got a description of our enemy. He violently opposes Anyone that follows after Christ, whether you're part of Israel, God's chosen people that God's not finished with yet, or you're part of the bride of Christ, part of the church today, uh, the devil hates you with a vengeance. And the devil doesn't want you to know what's recorded here in Revelation chapter 12. He doesn't want you to receive it. That's probably why you've got a lot of distractions going on as you're trying to listen to this, because the devil doesn't want you to know the truth. The devil doesn't want you to know what's going to happen as God has already predetermined it to happen. And so know your enemy, the devil's description. Now let me say something about the devil's demons. Because I'm here to tell you there are demons. And these are fallen angels. And they're on this world today. And they're seeking bodies that they might possess. They might carry out their evil deeds upon planet earth. Now, if you're a Christian, I don't believe that you can be possessed by the devil. Because if you're a Christian, you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit and a demon are not going to live in the same house. And so if you're a Christian, you don't have to be concerned about being demon-possessed. Now, I believe you can be demon-oppressed. I believe demons come upon God's people and demons try to distract us and demons try to disrupt us. But demons cannot have the upper hand unless we allow demons to have the upper hand. Because as Christians, again, we've got the power of God living in us and we can't overcome whatever they throw at us. So uh, let's say a word or two here about the devil's demons. Verse 7, <clears throat> verse 7 says, Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Now, I know that many people approach this part of the scripture here, and they teach this as being uh, when the devil initially, <clears throat> originally, excuse me, was cast out of heaven because he wanted to be God. But I don't believe this is referred to that. I want you to think about this text right here in a little bit different way. This verse 7 when it talks about war in heaven and Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fall back. And so there's this battle going on in heaven. And I don't quite understand this, what I'm getting ready to say. But it's true regardless. Right now, the devil has access into heaven for whatever reason. I don't know why God allows this, but it's true. The devil is able to come before the throne of God right now, and the devil does this to accuse us. He's accusing the brethren, the Bible says. I mean, you just studied the story of Job in the Old Testament. The Bible says that the devil came before God 
and was accusing Job. Remember how Satan was telling God, you know, if you let me at him, let me take away the blessings that you've given him and he'll curse you. And so the devil's standing there in heaven before the throne of God accusing Job. And I believe that's happening today. I believe the devil's going before God and he's accusing me and he's accusing you if you're a born again Christian. But here's the good news. When the devil goes up into the presence of God, he accuses me. The old devil stands there and he says, okay, God, uh, did you hear what Mike Dixon just said? Did you see the thought Mike Dixon just had? Did you see what Mike Dixon just did? Sitting beside God the Father in heaven at his right side, at his right hand, is God the Son, Jesus our Savior. And at that point in time, when the old devil's accusing us, Jesus turns to the Father, and I believe Jesus says something like this. Maybe Jesus says, you know, uh, Father, I'm not denying anything the old devil just said. I mean, it's true. Uh, Mike did that. Mike said that. Mike thought that. It's true. But God, you need to remember, he's one of ours. You need to remember, Mike Dixon's under the blood. You need to remember, Mike Dixon's under grace. You need to remember, Mike Dixon has been forgiven. See, we've got an advocate in heaven. We've got someone representing us. Isn't that good stuff? At the right hand of God the Father. So even when the old devil <clears throat> accuses us before God himself, uh, Jesus is our advocate and he's right there. Right there taking up for us, defending us at the right hand of God the Father. Now, I believe there's coming a day and it's going to be during the tribulation period. That's where I believe verse 7 fits in. There's coming a time where God is going to look to Michael the archangel and God's going to say enough is enough. I don't want this old devil coming into my presence anymore, accusing my people. Michael, cast him out of heaven for good. And I believe in my sanctified imagination, Michael the archangel is going to walk over and he's going to grab Satan by the nap of the neck. Maybe he's going to give him a good shaking. He's going to walk over to the edge of heaven. And I picture a, a baseball pitcher standing on a pitcher's mound and he's getting ready to pitch that ball. And maybe he's winding up, old Michael the archangel, winding up. And he gives old Satan a good pitch out of the presence of God, out of heaven. Boom. Cast him out of heaven for good, never again to accuse the brethren. I believe that's going to happen during the tribulation period. I believe verse 7 right here in Revelation chapter 12 is referring to that point in time during the tribulation period where God's going to say enough is enough. Now, not only do we have the red dragon, but we've got demons. We've got an army of fallen angels that do the devil's bidding, that come against us on a regular basis. He is a spiritual foe, and he's got a spiritual army. The Bible uh, says about his character that he's red. He's a dragon. That speaks of cruelty. That speaks of wickedness. He's a dragon. Red speaks of bloodshed. In the Bible, he's called a serpent. That speaks of trickery. I mean, he's very crafty. Um, as a serpent, he's tempting, he's seductive, um, he's called the devil, the word devil means accuser, he's the accuser of the brethren, he's a slanderer, he's a liar, Satan speaks of the fact uh, that he is the adversary of anything that's godly, he deceives the whole wide world, you know, there's a lot of Baptist churches today who think it's all about doing what you can do. That uh, religion is all about works, but I'm telling you that's a lie. Re Christianity is not about works. Maybe religion is about works, but Christianity, my friend, is not about works. Christianity is about a relationship with God uh, through Jesus Christ. So the devil would deceive the whole wide world. Now look at verse 10 of Revelation chapter 12. It says in verse 10, and I heard a loud voice in heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. See, that's what I was just talking about during the tribulation period. Old Michael Krabs grabs Satan by the nap of the neck and casts him out of heaven. He's the accuser of the brethren, but the time is coming. The time is coming. And I believe it's closer and nearer than any of us really realize where that, that accuser is not going to accuse us anymore. Now, we've got a description of our enemy right here in Revelation 12. We've got a reference here to the devil's demons. 
Number three, my last point, let me say something about the devil's defeat. Because, I mean, how do you overcome him? How do you overcome discouragement, depression, anxiety, stress? How do you overcome temptation when it comes your way? How are you going to overcome the devil? Um, how are you going to resist? So well, look at verse 11. And it says, and they have conquered him. They've conquered this red dragon. They've con conquered uh, Satan and his demons. Uh, and, and there's a good word for us right here because that word conquered is translated uh, from a Greek word that means to overcome. They have overcome. Interestingly, let me teach you some Greek here. It's also the same Greek word that we get the word Nike from. Now, I know you're familiar with the word Nike. Nike is from a Greek word that means to overcome. You can jump higher with Nike shoes, right? You're supposed to be able to run faster with Nike shoes. Uh, you're supposed to be able to overcome your opponent with Nike shoes. And so um, it's the same idea here. Uh, the United States and our military, I know once upon a time, I think it's still true, they have a Nike missile. And so that word means to overcome. We're overcomers. And so in our English Bible here, the translation in verse 11, they have Nike'd him, they have overcome him, they have conquered him. We're overcomers. Well, how'd they do it? How'd they overcome the enemy? Verse 11, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb. There's our first weapon, the blood of Jesus. There's power in the blood. That's the perfect sacrifice. When the devil comes against you and you're tempted and demons seem like they're attacking you, what I believe you all to do is you all to claim the blood of Jesus. I believe it's good for us to speak it out loud too. I, I tell the old devil and the demons, I say, get away from me. I'm under the blood. You can't touch me. I'm under the blood. You can't mess with me. I'm covered in the blood, see? The blood of the lamb, the blood of Jesus, they overcame, they conquered the enemy by the blood of Jesus. Now, not only by the blood of the lamb, but the Bible goes on and says they conquered him, they knocked him, they overcame the enemy by the blood of Jesus, but also our testimony. You know, there's great power in our testimony. It says by the word of their testimony, they overcame the enemy. You know, I'm supposed to go out and I'm supposed to tell people my story, what Jesus Christ has done for me. There's power in that. You know, people can argue all day long about a passage of scripture, but people can't argue about what God's done in your life. Do you hear me? Can I get an amen? Can I get a witness? People can't argue about what's, what's evident in your life. I mean, people can't argue when I tell them my story, how I used to be a drug addict and how I used to stick needles in my arms to shoot up and just check out and forget about my problems. Uh, people can't argue with that. I, that's what I used to be, but I'm not anymore. Over 30 years now, recovered from drug addiction and alcoholism and the life that I once lived, people can't argue with that. That's reality. I'm standing here flesh and blood, and this is the testimony. You can go back and you ask people I went to high school with. You want evidence of the fact that my story is true. So people can't argue with that. There's power. There's power when you're under the blood of Jesus. That's the first thing. You've got to make sure you're under the blood. But then there's power in your testimony. In what God has done in your life. Rebuke the devil. I believe when demons come after you, tell them, remind them, I'm under the blood, devil. You can't mess with me. In fact, let me tell you my salvation story. I remember how I got saved, trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, opened my heart to him, asked Jesus to come in. And ever since that day, I've never been the same again. I know I belong to God because I've been changed. You remind the old devil about that. Under the blood, your testimony. Man, great power in that. And let me tell you a third weapon. Jesus first. Jesus first. Now, I worded this C, this third subpoint here, uh, intentionally like this. It's got to be Jesus first. You don't have to run around this life worried and scared to death about, you know, the devil and what he's going to do. Look at verse 11. This is where I see this, Jesus first. Verse 11. For they loved not their lives even unto death. In other words, Jesus first. I am sold out. How do these people overcome the devil and the demons? The blood of Jesus, their testimony, and not loving their life even unto death. Being totally surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Whatever it costs me, if it costs me my life, Lord God, I'm ready to lay it down for the cause of the gospel. And during the tribulation period, there's going to be a lot of believers that are going to be executed. People who get saved after the rapture of the church. 
the people, of, the people of Israel, the Jewish people that are being persecuted, there's going to be a lot of martyrs. A lot of people are going to lose their life. They're going to be put to death simply because of their faith. Laying down, not loving their lives, even unto death. Put Jesus first. You know, don't run around here with religion. Don't be half-hearted in your commitment to the Lord. Don't just give lip service. Man, again, I think about Jonah. Again, that series I'm doing on Sunday morning. Don't be a half-hearted Christian. Don't be a lukewarm Christian. Be totally sold out. Make sure that Jesus is first. And so how can we overcome? Well, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome by the word of our testimony. We overcome by making sure Jesus is first. And we overcome with the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice. The devil hates joy. The devil hates the joy of the Lord. And he'll try to steal your joy. He'll try to come after your joy. He'll try to do everything he can to steal your joy. You know, the Bible says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. You may not have thought about joy as being a weapon against the enemy, but it is. So be joyful. Even going through a pandemic, even dealing with heartache, even dealing with financial crisis, even dealing with uncertainty, even dealing with all the unrest and division in our country today as a born-again Christian, it matters not what I'm going through. What it matters is who lives in me, and because I know he lives in me and I've got his power, I can have the joy of the Lord regardless of what's going on around me, and that is a great weapon against the enemy. See, the devil's going to get his. Things are not going to continue the way that things have continued. Look at verse 14. God's going to deliver Israel during the tribulation period. God's always going to look after his people. Verse 14. But the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and half a time. Now, that phrase right there, time represents one, times, plural, represents two, one plus two is three, half represents half, and so we're talking about three and a half years. We're talking about the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. God, again, is going to have this 144,000 Messianic Jews. God's going to have a place for them in the wilderness. He's going to protect them from the enemy. The dragon's going to try to get to them, but he can't. And uh, God's going to take care of his people. Now in Zechariah 13, verse 8, Zechariah 13, verse 8, indicates that two-thirds of Israel, two-thirds of the Hebrew people are going to be slaughtered. They're going to be killed during the tribulation period. That's Zechariah 13, verse 8. Two-thirds of Israel is going to be killed. But that's going to leave a third. God's always going to have a remnant. God's always going to have a remnant. And these are going to be protected, verse 14, for time, times, and half a time. For the last three and a half years of tribulation period, the worst period of time the world has ever seen, God's going to protect his people, his chosen people. Verse 15 tells us that Satan's going to spew forth a flood. It's going to be like a flood of water coming out of his mouth. And this is a picture of the persecution that's going to come after God's people. And the Antichrist, the devil that empowers him, the demons of hell, are going to want to get to these sealed Jews out in the wilderness, but they're not going to be able to. God's going to be protecting them, and that's going to make the Antichrist and the forces of evil even more angry. And so since they can't get to those that are being protected by God, they go after the offspring. They go after those that they can get to with a vengeance to destroy them. Verse 17, on the rest of her offspring, they go after those that they can and so again, all this is happening, I believe, during the last three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation period. As this dragon, uh, this demonic force is empowering the Antichrist as he leads the world. You know, the devil's having his heyday. And uh, the devil's going to have his heyday, even when the tribulation period begins. In fact, when you think about the church now, uh, we're the spirit-filled body of Christ in the world. We're really the restraining force against evil today in our wicked world. We're pushing back the forces of evil just because we exist here at this point in time. And even when the rapture of the church happens and the Lord snatches away his church, this restraining force in the world, as bad as things are right now as far as wickedness, imagine what's going to happen once that restraining force of the church is removed. Wickedness is going to run rapid. 
No restraining force. And so the devil's going to have his heyday, but the devil's going to get his. He's running out of time. And he knows he's running out of time. And I believe that's why he's so busy in our world today. He's so busy in our country today. You know, so you may say at the end of this study tonight, when we think about the devil and our enemy, you may say, well, you know, I'm not afraid of the devil. Well, that's not really the question you ought to ask. It's not, it's not really a question, are you afraid of him? The question is, is he afraid of you? Are you living your life as a born-again Christian in the power of the Holy Spirit in such a way that you are a threat to the enemy? God help us. God help us to live our life in such a way that the enemy knows we're a threat. That the enemy trembles when they come against us, when demonic forces come against us because we're so full of Jesus uh, that it causes the old demons and the devil to knee knock. I mean, they're scared to death because we're so close to God. And so is the devil afraid of you? I'm just saying he will be if you're under the blood. You know your testimony, what God's done in your life. He's saved you. He's changed you. You're putting Jesus first. He's Lord of your life. And no matter what it costs you, and you feel with the joy of the Lord no matter what. That's how we overcome. My friend, I hope this study's been a blessing to you in Revelation chapter 12. Again, I just want to remind you, like it. By all means, share it. Let's get the word out. Let's tell folks around us, listen, this is what God says is going to happen. And God knows what's going to happen, not because he sees the future, but because he's already laid it out. He's already written the future. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your blessed word, your truth, Lord, today. I thank you for the book of the Revelation. Thank you for making it so we can understand it, we can receive it, we can accept it. Right now, I just praise your words gone out that it would not return void. Lord, do a work only you can do.